welcome back to another brand new episode of the 10 Days of Oscars here on the Cinephiles YouTube channel. I am one half of the Cinephiles, the outlaw John Roca, joined as always by Steve Morris. Steve, how are you? We're about to dive into the zone of interest. How are you feeling? I am trepidatious. I mean, it, I, look, it's not surprising that this was the last movie of all the Oscar picks I've watched. I think we talked about it way back when we did Judgment of Nuremberg on the Cinephiles is I'm Jewish. I've been raised uh, at the time that I was raised. I was exposed to a tremendous amount of information on the Holocaust. I watched the real live, you know, the footage of bodies and stuff when I was probably nine years old. I met many people that had tattoos on their arms. I have read and watched, you know, from Elie Wiesel to the Shoah and all those things. I'm deeply steeped in it. And I do not relish, uh, you know, movies on the Holocaust. I don't seek them out. I think they're extremely important. Yeah. I think they're important for us to watch. I think this is an important film. But I wasn't looking forward to watching it. And it was, this was, a, I'm going to say something. There, this is a year that has a film like Poor Things as an Oscar nomination. Yeah. I think, in fact, this is the strangest film of all the Oscar films. This is a very weird movie. And it is very powerful in a way unlike any Holocaust film ever made, in my opinion. Yeah, um, I, would, I, yeah. I would agree with you, Steve. I think it's the strangest Holocaust film that, uh, sorry, strangest film about the Holocaust that I've ever seen. There are some artistic flourishes here by the director, Jonathan Glazer, that he takes. There are the black frames with the score playing for a certain amount of time. Near the end of the movie, there's that moment where we go to modern day and a bunch of people are cleaning the Auschwitz uh, Memorial Museum there before it opens up for the day. So there's a lot of interesting parts of the moving parts of this um, film, and we never actually go into Auschwitz in the movie, we stay pretty much in the house. And if we go outside of the house, it's by the brook or by that river. Um, or we go to the uh, the, um, the headquarters of where the Nazis are stationed there to have a conversation about uh, the, the next command uh, that, um, uh, that uh, Rudolf Hoss is going to have. Um, and it's a fascinating movie because of those artistic flourishes. It keeps you on your toes. Uh, and it it'll, either keeps you or it loses you with the decisions that Jonathan Glazer makes as a director. What did you think about his um, direction of the movie? I know you're writing a book on direction, so I know you're either very aware of this stuff and keen on it. What were your thoughts on his direction uh, throughout the movie? Well, this, is a, again, it's a weird movie. Mm. So it, it was weird. It's funny. You and I talked when we talked about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And I know you're like, what? what is the comparison between these two films? <laughs> but both of us went, if you don't know anything about the Manson family, yeah. what is it like to watch this movie? Right. If you didn't know, if you never knew there was a Holocaust, if you yeah. didn't know what Auschwitz was, I don't know what this movie is. I, and it's funny, too. Like, oh, yeah. so uh, you say, I'm, you know, I, I just, I'm writing a book on directing. I've teach directing i've thought about directing and i have very strong opinions which you've heard over and over again probably ad nauseum on the cinephiles and those are all about things about developing character and conflict and story and i've often said you know many many times i said look if there's something that doesn't directly contribute to the film you should probably cut it out Almost this entire film does not have characters. It really doesn't have a lot of story, very little story. There's the vast majority of the dialogue and the moments are totally incidental. Yeah. It's just, it's, oh, pass me one of those and yeah, go swimming and I'm going to do this. And I got this phone call and people are just talking about things. Mm -hmm. There isn't very much conflict within the characters in the actual movie. And what makes it all so powerful is what's happening on the other side of that wall. Yeah, it's the sound. It's the knowledge that this isn't just a family that's going swimming or making a birthday cake or having dinner or going, you know, it, or riding on the river. It's that this is a family doing all of those totally normal things. And right on the other side of the wall is one of the greatest atrocities in human history. And the guy who's the head of this family is leading the greatest atrocity in human history. That's what makes the movie work. And so it's like, that is really weird in terms of filmmaking. So as a, you know, you asked me what I think of the directing. I think it's remarkable. And there are all these things they do, particularly there's this cutting style where like someone's walking down a hallway and then you, they turn and you cut 90 degrees to them yeah. walking and then you 90 degrees to them walking. Totally unusual shot selection that yeah. it's, it's very clinical. Like you're just sort of watching almost documentary style, 
these things happening. And it's so like, I literally kept writing down in my notes, oh, we're 15 minutes in the, and nobody said anything important. We're not, it's like 19 minutes into the movie before you have any mention of anything remotely related to the Holocaust, which is when they're discussing the crematoriums. Yeah. 19 minutes into an hour and 40 minute film and nothing important has happened in terms of things that normal movies have like characters and story and conflict. Yeah. And you know, this is a film that I think lives, <coughs> sorry, lives and dies by its sound design. Uh, and I don't feel that way about a lot of movies and, and maybe because I'm not as steeped in the idea, <coughs> sorry. And the idea of how the sound design helps a film, um, achieve what it achieves emotionally or, uh, impressively with the audience. But I will say this is one of those films where the sound design absolutely did a lot of the work in terms of laying out the conflict, right? Because you're right. There's not really any kind of conflict laid out for this guy other than he wants to stay the commander in this place uh, because his wife has you know, created a garden played by Sandra Huller, she, who we just talked about last, yesterday on Anatomy of a Fall. She's like laid out this whole thing, and the last thing she wants to do is move. And the right. hubris of her to take him out onto that uh, makeshift pier or dock and have this conversation with him as if she can tell the Nazis where she wants to be, I think was a fascinating moment to explore how these people think this is just a job. This is just a job that they're doing. And the way the, the, the wife looks at it as well, it's just a job. And you can tell them to find some way to make sure your boss can keep you here as if it's not some kind of... Um, sadistic, uh, racist, um, genocidal uh, movement here that she is a part of and married into. So it's a fascinating element of it all. But the sound design, constantly hearing the sounds of the, pe the, the Jewish people in Auschwitz, we hear that underneath a lot of what's going on, you know, and especially when the mother comes to visit and can't stomach it any longer and leaves, that kind of shows you how you have to kind of turn certain things off in order to be able to function. And I think the film is topical for a lot of reasons. And yes, it's, of course, the Holocaust, of course, what's going on now with Israel and Gaza. And of course, they couldn't have predicted that when this film came out. But the, the situation also of how some people feel that other people are ignoring evil that is happening in their own backyards and are pretending as if, not, as if it's not happening and they're just going on with their lives. And other people from a pol another political point of view think those people are ignoring the evil that is going on in our world and being blissfully unaware of it because they're profiting from it and they're purposely not paying attention to the things that are going on and the deaths and the uh, results of all of this and the fractured families. And so it's it's someone said to me, it's not the it's not the evil of banality, it's the banality of evil. And that's what they think this film represents to them. And that really stopped me cold because I hadn't figured out how I felt about the movie until they said that. And that's the true thing. There's evil is not just this twirling mustache evil thing that just kills and whatever. It's also the fact that it's so matter of fact. That's what makes it evil when it approaches. It's it's what it's doing with such a matter of fact. No big deal. This is just another Tuesday in my life type of approach. That's the kind of evil that chills you to the bone. And we see that clearly throughout the movie because these are interesting characters we see because you know, the performances here i want to give credit to the actors from christian friedel and sandra huller of course as the two main they're interesting performers but and you can get yourself kind of caught up in what's going on with their lives but the whole time this feeling of the death of jewish people the murder of jewish people in horrific ways is happening just over that wall so I'm glad you brought up the banality of evil. I was, if you hadn't, I was going to bring it up because this is the quote that was going in my head the entire time I was watching the film. And yeah. this comes from, uh, it comes from uh, Han Hannah Arendt, who was writing about the trial of Adolf Eichmann. Oh. That's where the, the term, the banality of evil comes from. Yeah. And that's the whole, that's the whole movie to me is that yeah. phrase, because yeah. this is the banality is that they're making dinner and they're doing the dishes and they're doing laundry and they're having conversations about your job and where you're going to work. And do we have to move and look at the garden? And it is, I think that is the most chilling thing about this film 
And I and I think it we have to apply that to ourselves all the time. Oh, sure. Because there are terrible things going on in the world right now. There are, you know, if you walk around the streets of Los Angeles, you walk by someone who's homeless. And I'm sure you've had this experience yeah. where you walk by someone unconscious on the sidewalk yeah. and have the thought of that person could be dead. I yeah. don't know. Yes. And our, our all brain. of us, yeah. And all of us have walked right by and yeah. gone to the movie and gone to dinner and gone to, and not, you know, and I'm not, and this is what life is. This is what human beings, human beings are capable of incredible greatness, but they're also capable of incredible callousness and self-obsession. And like the, you know, those moments in the film, the, the mom being one, as she looks out and sees the chimney and that yeah. chimney, which they don't show all the time and we don't see smoke all the time or the little kid playing like a little kid and he's playing with toy soldiers. And then he looks up and he sees the chimney. And from what I know about Auschwitz is that it wasn't just visual. It smelled. Yeah. You could smell the bodies and you could smell. There was a, you know, the smell of crematoriums run 24 seven to kill thousands of people at a time yeah. smelled. And the, the, I mean, the profundity of them being able to play in the river and mm -hmm. swim and have family over and have parties while this is going on on the other side of the wall. And this is our world. You know, like it's, it, we, I don't want to live in the land of always thinking about Ukraine or always thinking about Israel and Gaza or always thinking about the thousand other terrible things that are going on. The, yeah. the way that I get my food, you know, that the fact is, is that if you buy shrimp in the store and you don't buy it from a good source, there's a good chance that slave labor was used to catch that shrimp that you're eating in the store. Like this is we are connected to evil across the planet in a million different ways. And we can't always live our lives just thinking about that all the time, but we shouldn't live our lives not thinking about it at all. Yeah. 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 You kind of understand why people kind of unplug and go off and live in the woods because they, they their yeah. feeling of the guilt of all of it um, and their contribution to it gets to them. And they eventually make that decision to break from society. And I, you know, and, and that's a great point, Steve, you bring up, you're right. We, these are these little um, conversations and agreements we make with ourselves in those moments to not think about certain things because we have to kind of function. We have to keep going. We have to keep doing the things we're doing. And if I spend too much time thinking about it, I'll just shut down, right? And these yeah. are these little um, uh, rationalizations we make with ourselves as we go forward. So, yes, it's easy to look at this and go, oh, look at these evil Nazis and the things that they are doing. And certainly there are chilling moments throughout, like when she's trying on the clothes of – from the dead Jewish women and uh, you know, that her and her maids are in there like trying it on or family members, whatever her mom having enough of it, I think was really critical. This idea of even yeah. there were Germans who knew what was going on and were sickened by it. And even, and, and look again, I think it's very topical because whatever your feelings are politically, right? Let's say you're against liberals against Joe Biden, the liberals or against MAGA or whatever. Like in your mind, you think to yourself, if your daughter has gone over to the other side, you love them, so you want to find a way to communicate with them, but then eventually you can't anymore and you have to get out of that situation. Uh, and the fact that like she was showing off her garden, like it was no big deal, while thousands of Jewish people were being gassed on the other side of the wall, I think was is a great example of that, that people sometimes can just absolutely rationalize their lives and function because they need to function and they do that because they're in a position of power at the time and they don't want to lose that power. And, you know, she speaks about having come from humble beginnings and this was all she had dreamed about. This was all she ever wanted, which is why she was desperate not to lose the house because she had spent so much time uh, beautifying it, in essence, uh, to fit what she wanted. Uh, and so giving up the house for her, as if other people weren't dying for her to have this house, um, was an offense. And so those are those things when you're watching the movie that really tax you and challenge you as a viewer. And, and I thought Jonathan Glazer did a wonderful job adapting um, this original book from uh, Martin Amos, the 2014 novel that he did, and put that in, put, and put it here. Did I think his artistic flourishes were one or two too many? Possibly just, you know, just lose a few notes and it'll be fine. But, but overall, though, I felt that he absolutely delivered the hammer blow. He wanted to deliver it with certain scenes and certain moments. Like when he's, um, I think he has sex with the Jewish secretary and then he goes and washes himself in the basin 
which is really unsettling. It just shows you, see, for them, they were happy to use what the thing that they said they wanted to destroy and kill, they were happy to use it for their own benefits. And so it just shows you that kind of approach to this kind of evil um, that we see in the world and how it has to be stopped whenever we see it pop up. Well, ju just in that moment, he washes himself in the same way that he has the kids all wash themselves after they find the Jewish body parts where they had been swimming. Yes. And it's like the fact that the death and the sex have to be washed off because of contact with these people. Right. And, th and this is the thing, is that in order to have a Holocaust, yeah. you must first dehumanize the Jews and the yes. gypsies and homosexuals. And this is true in every situation, whether it is, you know, Rwanda or the Uyghurs or you know Cambodia yeah. or all over the world where people have said we got to wipe out those other people the first step is to say those people are less than human yeah. and so the wherever it happens and the fact is humans are able to do this and the same is true as you brought up with like whether you're you know a Trump supporter or a Biden supporter or whatever is our tendency is therefore to dehumanize that other side and say right. they are mad they are crazy they're evil they're not worth our time whatever that group is and even though that seems like a natural thing to do when you're presented with something that seems horrendous but that 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 dehumanization yeah. it isn't that doesn't transform the people that you hate yeah. dehumanizing them the only person it transforms is you yeah. because what you are taking away is your own humanity yeah. you are because our humanity is to see other people as human even people we disagree with even people we have problems with and as soon as you go they are less than yeah. well then you might kill them but in doing so you've dehumanized yourself yeah, and there are certain moments like the fact that he's reading Hansel and Gretel to the kids. Doesn't she bake them in an oven, Hansel and Gretel, the witch? So no. it's like this. this well, they bake her. They bake. They yeah, they, they she her, wants right. to bake so, them. Yeah, yeah, she wants to. So that kind of thing, I think, is really interesting as a as a as a symbolic story to be told in that moment, um, as well. And this idea that you know he is when he goes to visit the uh, was it SS main economic and administrative office. He's been thinking about the most efficient way to gas Jewish people. It's like, wow. And then as he comes down the stairs, Steve, what is, what is your thoughts on this moment where he starts to retch? He starts to essentially dry he as if he's going to throw up, looks up, and then we're transported to a group of janitors at the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum who are cleaning up and preparing the museum for it to be showcased. Then we go back to him. And he goes back downstairs into the darkness. What were your thoughts in that moment uh, about that whole sequence? What did you think was happening? What was Jonathan Glazer trying to say? What is your interpretation of that? So this is where this is. This is a crazy movie that is like, this is what I'm doing. And there's such a clear yeah. vision here. And, and, and it's always fascinating to me, as I've said, where like none of these things for me as a writer or a director, none of what he does would have ever occurred to me. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like. And it's really powerful. And I, I want to back up to the moment before, because the, the, before the retching on the stairs, oh, yeah. he's standing on a balcony at some big fancy event, and it's filled with uh, German members of the high command dressed to the nines, and he's looking down at the balcony, and then he calls his wife in the middle yeah. of the night, wakes her up. She doesn't really want to talk. And he says, when I stood there, all I was thinking was how I would gas them all. And it's a really difficult thing because it was the high ceilings and lots of space. And that would be difficult. And I don't know. And she kind of wants, like, I want to go to bed. Yeah. And he obviously wants to talk. And he's saying, hey, it's good news. I got the job. They're going to send me back. And I'm going to work there, which is ostensibly what he wanted. Right. And it could very well be that he is, that he loves killing. And he loves killing so much that that's all he thinks about. And that's why he called her. And that's why he's thinking of gassing all those people. It could be but what he's actually saying is I am been holding in my disgust with the evil that I'm doing. My brain has been so warped that all I can think of is, and I'm trying to talk to my wife to share something painful. And I don't know what it is. You know, I have, don't have an answer to this question. And then he comes down the stairs and starts to retch. Yeah. And it's like, it could be, you know, it's funny. We talked about anatomy of a fall yesterday and how yeah. unreliable all the narrators are. And it's like, well, it could be he ate something that disagreed with him. Sure. And he just felt sick and it has nothing to do with anything emotional whatsoever. Or it could be that the disgust of, of himself and the evil that he is knows that he is, because while we don't see the dead bodies and the bodies going mm -hmm. into the ovens and the crematorium and all of the stuff, 
He does. He sees that every single day. Right. And it could be that he's been comp- you know, pressing that down and it's all starting to come up in that moment. Yeah. It could be that. And that's sort of how I feel. I mean, that's kind of what I'm seeing. The cuts to modern day at first, it's just like so jarring. Yeah. And they've got name tags on and blue shirts. And then when you see the exhibits and when I went to the Holocaust Museum in Berlin, which is incredibly oh. profound and powerful place, there, there are these spaces which are very much like you see there, which is the shoes and the yeah. luggage and the and the and the and there's even a what's so strange is in a weird way there's a banality to them cleaning up because they're just clean this is their job yeah, this they're cleaning job. up every day so right. they're in this space this sacred space of human suffering yeah just doing their job and we're there kind of spying on them and it is so profound and difficult yeah. and then you go back to him and he walks into the darkness which i mean we can't get more symbolic than yeah you know, the architect of hundreds of thousands of deaths walking off into the darkness. Yeah. I think also I, f- it, the way I interpret it is that just, this is Jonathan Glazer's comment that people are starting to forget about the Holocaust. They're starting to kind of just blow it off or it kind of see it as way in the past. And the fact that you see these janitors cleaning it. So just kind of matter of factly, you know, and not, taking a moment to really see how this stuff affects them because they've been around it so much that it has lost its power in terms of its effect on them from what we see them. And I, and I think that's true in my opinion and is my perspective is that he's making a commentary about that because if you look at the statistics nowadays, the numbers of people who think the Holocaust never happened has increased. The number of people who don't know about the Holocaust has increased. And we obviously see the anti-Semitic stuff that goes on in our world every day across the globe. And it's kind of heartbreaking and devastating for people of like you and me of a certain age who had it very much ingrained to our lives. that it was an important thing to be aware of, to, to treat with respect uh, and to uh, make very clear it should never happen again. Yet it's not a coincidence that the more that people don't know about it, the more that people say it never happened, the more that people get distance from it, we start to see these elements that um, led to the Holocaust in the first place start to pop up in stronger numbers and in stronger and in uh, uh, more places across the globe. And that's truly unsettling. And I think that's what Jonathan was saying. And I'm I'm not going to get into his speech, nor should we get into this speech uh, at the Oscars. That's for other people to have points of views and opinions on. But I think he was saying something uh, connected to that in his speech, and I that's what he, I believe that's what he was trying to get across. And so it's just like um, I think it's a I think it's a devastatingly powerful film for many reasons, but certainly that moment is the moment for me that kind of elevated this film to a position where it should be considered for best picture. So I was not surprised when it got nominated. I I think it's a truly profound moment, and I hope people. I mean, I'm trying to think of how I want to talk about this. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll just, here, here's what I'll say. And I, I think I said this years ago when we did Judge of Nuremberg, is I was raised with the phrase never again. And never yeah. again was a phrase repeated over and over again. And it wasn't until around the time that we did that podcast years ago yeah. that I realized that there are two different meanings that people take away from that statement. The way I was raised and what I always believed was it meant never again should this happen to anyone. Yeah. That it doesn't matter whether it's chattel slavery in America or Stalin or Mao or Pol Pot or any other time where you take a group of people, you dehumanize them, and then you do terrible things to them because you've dehumanized them. That's wrong. And that is what I believe my responsibility, although I'm an atheist, I'm also proud of my Jewish heritage and the Jewish sense of justice. And that is what I believe it is my responsibility to fight against. And it was only in the last few years that I realized that there is another definition that people hold just as strongly or even more so. And that is never again should this happen to us. Mm. And those two things are entirely different. And I am deeply concerned about when we move from one to the other. Because I do not personally believe that Jewish people, while I'm proud of my people and my culture, we're all just people. And we have to be just as careful and just as much committed to justice for all people. Yeah. And that's what that's what my Jewishness means to me. Yeah. And it is, it is, it, it, we're in a time, 
it's funny. I growing up, I, it's not that I never experienced any anti-Semitism, but it was like a minor, like someone said, oh, he Jewed him down when they're talking about money or made a money comment or something like that. I've never been scared before. And I'm not personally frightened at this moment, but there's scary shit going on in the world about yeah. Jewish people that I thought was never going to come back. And it's here. And so the two things of what is my feeling about Jewish justice and what do I think never again means? And what is my feeling about anti-Semitism that I see rising in the world in a terrifying way? Yeah. I think these are both huge things that we, not just as Jews, but as humans have to reckon with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why this film, I think it's one of the reasons why this film is uh, so important and I think deserved a Best Picture nominee, Steve, because, or nomination rather, because um, of the conversations that it's prompted uh, just like this, just like the one that we've had just now talk, talking about the movie and the different uh, meanings and the different things it uh, triggered in us to discuss here in this conversation over Zone of Interest. Um, anything more, any final words on the film that you want to make sure we touch on or anything we missed uh, before we wrap up here? I think there are uh, more enjoyable films, certainly, <laughs> this year. I think there are better films in many ways. I think they're more moving films. I think they're more challenging films. Uh, maybe not challenging. I think there are more interesting films in terms of filmmaking. I think this is an important film and it's a film that people should watch. And just like I resisted it for a long time and didn't really want to watch it. And I'm not going to watch it again anytime soon, but I do think it's important and I think people should see it. Absolutely. One last thing I want to give credit to Micah Levi who did the score for this film. And mm. I thought the score was uh, really powerful in certain moments and uh, to underlie the emotional resonance of what was going on in those scenes. And I thought, it was a fantastic score uh, there as well. I, I um, just add. Um, I, let me just add. Let me just add yeah. sound design to that too, because yeah. you are constantly aware of Auschwitz in the background throughout yeah. the entire film. Certainly touched on that earlier, and I'm, I'm glad you agree with it as well, Steve. Uh, all right, well, there you go. That's our conversation uh, over Zone of Interest. Thank you all so much for joining us for this recent installment of 10 Days of Oscars. We've got one more film to cover here on 10 Days of Oscars, and we will be back with that film tomorrow. Um, but um, thank you so much for listening to us or for uh, uh, watching us. And if you are watching us on YouTube, please make sure you leave a comment down below. What are your thoughts on zone of interest what did it trigger for you what are your what's your speculation on what that moment meant near the end of the movie when we went modern day and then back into the past uh and what you felt about the uh, sound design the score the direction and the performances throughout this movie let us know down in the comment section below steve what do we have to tell these fine folks about our show well they can like and subscribe to the youtube channel right here you can subscribe to the podcast anywhere you get your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, where you can also subscribe to our bonus feed where you get bonus episodes as well as ad-free versions of the show. Hmm. Patreon.com slash The Cinephiles is another place to support the show where you get that content as well as our watch-alongs and could join the advisory board. And if you want to reach me, you can do it at SR Morris on Twitter and SR Morris one on Instagram. And just to make it clear, we don't always talk about very serious movies. We just did a live episode that you can go back and watch on YouTube or listen to on our podcast feed where we talked about 1986's Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield just to kind of uh, lighten the mood a little bit. All right, there you go. You can follow me at The Roca Says on Twitter, Instagram, uh, and TikTok, uh, The Outline Nation on TikTok, rather. And then uh, we'll be back tomorrow with our final day and our final installment of the 10 Days of Oscars here on The Cinephiles. Take care. Until then.